My name is Spencer Higa, and you're listening to the Drop Draw Flies podcast. Boom! I've got, I only have one tool to tie the fly, and his name's Jason. Um, <laughs> I'm Lance Egan, and I forgot what I was supposed to say. <laughs> it's like sending a receiver over the middle with linebackers just waiting, and the receiver turns back at the quarterback, catches the ball, and then he's knocked out for like half hour. Just stick them solid. <laughs> Welcome to the Drop Jaw Flies podcast, your source for fly fishing talk, tips, and stories. In this episode, Jason and I host a discussion on fishing for trout in the fall. Conditions in the fall months present a great opportunity to find and land that big one you've always wanted. We talk about the conditions, tactics we use, flies and patterns you might consider, and in general, what makes fall fishing so great. We hope you enjoy our podcast. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. I am Chad Nelson, along with my co-host, Jason Arvey. Here is today's podcast. All right, Jason. <clears throat> Let's do it, man. Today we're going to talk fall fishing. It is middle of October here. And we're kind of part way into our fall fishing, and man, you and I both love this time of year, tying on our flies, streamers, hitting our favorite water, and yeah, chasing fish. Yeah, definitely, and it's so pretty outside too. The heat's gone, and it's it's so nice to be able to get out and see all those colors, feel that chill in the air, and know that big fish are waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's definitely part of it because because of the weather. It's not super hot anymore. Mornings can be cold, but really, now you can fish pretty effectively all day long. Yeah, it's it's getting there for sure. Yeah. So when you think about fall fishing, I mean, man, this is a big topic. You and I were just kind of going over a few talking points, and that took a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> so... I don't know how much of it we're going to get through in one podcast. We'll see what we can get through today. If we don't get to it all, maybe we'll do a part two next week. But let's at least jump into uh, part of it anyhow and do an overview on fall fishing um, tips, tactics, techniques that we use. Uh, you need to be aware of conditions that are changing, and that really affects how you're going to approach it. And then... We want to cover both lakes and rivers. So, big, big uh, topic, a lot to cover. I'd say, <clears throat> yeah, huge. Lakes, it's a giant topic that a lot of people don't know much about. Uh, fly fishers spend a lot of time on the rivers in the fall. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of knowledge that's out there about that. So, yeah, uh, just, a, just a monster topic and a fun one, too. So when it comes to water, some of it's pretty obvious, but first, what's different about conditions in the fall? Uh, let's talk lake and then river, you know, versus spring, summer, and winter. What changes? Well, yeah, in the lake, um, it's kind of cool because the temperature of the water is the gatekeeper uh, for the trout's movement. Uh, because in the summer, in the peak summer months, um, they're down in that cooler water that holds more oxygen, but they still want to eat like crazy. And so if you're if you're fishing the bank, you've got to go there super early in the morning. The fish can come up a little bit out of the depths to go feed in the weed beds. But as soon as the sun hits the water, they are gone. And so then you've got to either have a boat or come back at night when that water will cool off and then they can go move around a little bit. In the fall, it's awesome because the water, and this is a topic we could, college courses are taught, but it's, it's turnover, and how the lake's water will mix. Yep. And that upper layer of water um, actually cools off, and uh, eventually the trout can just go wherever they want to for as long as they want to. There's no more 
uh, stress, hot water on the, uh, you know, they're not in the hot water, so to speak. Yeah, and so the top layer awesome. cools and it becomes more dense and it drops and the water literally turns over. Yeah. And uh, that that's going to affect your – and that's just a super brief synopsis, guys. We could get in depth in, in, into that. But um, it does bring up a lot of detritus and organisms and dirt, clay, mud, plant debris, all kinds of stuff. And it turns the water a, a different color. And so uh, that could determine your flies that you pick too. Yeah. Now, some say, too, that that kind of turns off fishing for a few days, maybe. It can happen in as quick as a day, sometimes three to four days, but the fish are sometimes confused. And so if you do hit the lake on a day that it's turning over, fishing might be off and you might need to come back in two or three days. Yeah. And uh, sometimes on on the big lakes, full turnover might take a month. But when it really hits, when that first layer drops down because it gets heavy, and then it really, the big plume of stuff comes up, that day is probably a day you might want to watch birds or do some <laughs> photography or write a poem, you know, something like that. Yeah, because we're all into writing poems for sure. <laughs> but after that, uh, even a couple days after that, the fishers are going to start looking for food regardless of how muddy it is. So, yeah, I'd 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 fish even that day, but uh, <laughs> when it happens, but yeah, good fish, man, start coming up then because, like I said, the wa- the temperature is different. Okay, so Jason, say we we hit our reservoir and and turnover's kind of in progress. How would you approach it? What would you do different versus pre-turnover? Um, you know, pre-turnover and clarity of water and everything, you still have to go into that summer pattern even though it's September or fall, beginning of fall. Fish are st- still held back by the by the water temperatures, the the thermocline and the surface. Uh, is the temperature is still stratified? They're still different. So, but turnover, man. I fish it. I would fish it from when you get there till you leave because the fish can be hanging out by the bank the whole time, and they're just cruising back and forth. So you just have to find them. And when the water color gets off, um, I would. U- I'm going to use a brighter color fly, and it's going to be bigger because I want the presence of the fly to be bigger where the visibility is not good. And so if it's really bright outside, conditions are bright, the water is dirty, I'm going to go with a bigger pattern. It's not going to be super crazy in the color. Um, uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a rattle. That one's but, sweet. So a redhead, you've got a – basically a red and white fly there for yeah. those just listening. Um, now, if the sun was off the water and I need a little bit brighter uh, presence and the water's murky, then I'm going to go to this. And for those listening, describe that one, Jason. This one is a, it's a chub head and it's kind of got the reddish brown top and there's a lot of chartreuse in there. And uh, there is some flash, too, to, to try and reflect what light there is. So, um, yeah, I, I would, in the dirtier water, you're definitely going to want to go brighter, contrast, sound if you have a rattle, um, bigger profile mm-hmm. so that it can, it can be seen better. Because wouldn't that be cool if you're deer hunting and the deer were wearing fluorescent orange? Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> Man. <laughs> <laughs> That would be so cool. Would that be considered hunting anymore? I don't know, man. But for fishing, I want my fly to stick out. Well, for sure. Hard. Yeah, anything that you can do to give you the edge. So visibility, uh, the rattle, like you said, uh, anything to attract the fish. Yeah. Um, and then early in the morning, I'm always going to go bigger. And so I would, I would maybe go with something Whoa. really big and bright and loud. <laughs> and that's that's what I'm going to start out with is something bright, big and loud. That is a killer fly, man. Well, thank you. Orange and purple. Orange, purple, loud, big profile. Um 
Yeah, it's hard to miss this one, and that's what you want to throw when when the water is stained. What is that, about seven inches? Yeah, it's about seven. So that's that's, uh, what I would start out with. And then more light gets on the water. I'm going to scale that down a little bit in in profile. I'm not going to go as big. Uh, More light gets on the water. I'm going to scale the fly down just a hair. But it's still going to be bright. Mm-hmm. So when the fish are up shallow, uh, really shallow, sometimes the rattle is a turnoff. So this is not that has no rattle, but it's still big enough and it's still really bright. Well, so last fall, you and I had great success on those oranges and reds, those bright colors. Yeah. The fish just seemed to be attracted to them, attacking them for whatever reason they worked. Yeah. Can't wait, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, and for those, uh, like Jason said, too, if, you're, if you don't have a boat, which you and I typically fish from shore, the great thing about fall is that the fish are in closer. Because like you said, the top layer has now cooled, so the fish can go everywhere in the lake. Uh, they do come up closer to the surface, closer to shore. And so, you know, a 30, 40 foot cast is going to get you in range to those big fish. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, that, and that's perfect. And they're, they're hunting all day long. There doesn't seem to be periods where they back off. They are just there to eat and they're, they're hunting all day long. And so, um, well, the one thing about the stained water is you can't see them as well. In fact, sometimes you can't see them at all, but you know that they're there. So you're, you're looking for the places that hold the food. And they like to hang out off off the weed beds that have have that slope, so they can go down in deeper water if they want to. But they can come up very quickly, find something, eat it, go back down, or just hang along that weed bed, you know, for as long as it extends. And they're just cruising back and forth. So, such an exciting time to fish uh, in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you and I have great success along the weed beds. We use an intermediate, typically type 2 sinking line. You don't have to get it down very deep. But we'd cast it out, let it sink, you know, five, six seconds, start stripping it in. And that's where we were having success. Yeah. um, Remember um, when turnover is at its peak and it's the water's the dirtiest, a technique that you can use is cast out. Sometimes you don't have to cast out very far because the fish are, like you said, they're just close. But if you that just assume each cast that there is a fish following your fly, just you can't see it, but just assume that it is. And right when you can see your fly and it's just off the weeds, try and let it hover mm-hmm. just right there. And don't, don't bring it in because the fish, if they see that stop, sometimes they'll just, bam, move forward and crush it. And so it's just kind of a hover. You're, you you see it and just kind of hold it out there. As far as you can, <laughs> extend your rod and just hold it there. How yeah. many times did <laughs> we see fish right there? <laughs> tons, tons. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, a nice thing, too, about fall, Jason, is there's, because of weather and maybe partly because football's now on tv it's hunting season but for whatever reason there's fewer guys out hitting the water so whether you have a favorite river a favorite lake it's a great time to get out because there's fewer guys to contend with yeah yeah keep watching football and doing whatever you're doing (laughs) yeah we're just sharing this for your information but we really don't want you to get out and fish (laughs) So, yeah, the reservoirs you usually have quite a bit of room to fish. Um, uh, that This information is also crosses over with all the trout, you know, and not just cutthroat. And all the trout go on kind of a feeding binge in the fall. So, so Jason, speaking of fish, um, the browns and brooks spawn in the fall. So, say guys, are, their favorite water holds browns and brooks and they want to go fishing how would you approach that knowing that they're spawning? Yeah, uh, it's an ethical question. Uh, some people just absolutely abhor fishing 
on the spawning when they're on the spawning beds and some people are okay with it. Yeah. Um, I think as it in a streamer context, uh, fishing pre spawn Browns can get super aggressive, you know, um, it's kind of like the guy at the bar that's look, trying to pick up a girl and there, you know, the <laughs> testosterone's flying and it's easy for them to get in a fight over a girl. But when the spawning is taking place on the bed, streamers are less effective. I mean, you might get a reaction bite or a frustration bite or, or something, but, um, those fish need to provide that service for them species and for us because we got to have that next generation and so i would i would probably i know it's hard to do because you see a huge fish on the bed and you want to catch it but he's but they are they need to not be stressed i have caught i have fished those beds uh before and and i'll be the first to admit it that i you know i've caused undue (laughs) stress to some fish and I, maybe it's just uh, that's uh, maybe an ethical question, moral question for fishing. But streamers definitely pre-spawn are going to be good, uh, and and the brighter, the cra- the flashier, the better. Put on your Vegas, go into Vegas costume type fly usually works good, and sometimes even the black ones work good. Post-spawn though, give the fish a little bit of time, and they go on the feed. Yeah, that's and a so, great time to throw on a streamer. I don't know, I, Chad. What what's your feeling on fishing while the fish are spawning? I mean, what? Yeah, that's a tough question because you know we have waters here that, in addition to those fish that are spawning, there's rainbows mm-hmm. that aren't spawning. Yeah, and, and so for someone to say, well, Chad, you should take the whole month off of November and not fish at all in November because Browns and Brooks are spawning, and we don't want to cause them undue stress. Yeah, I get it, but am I going to stop fishing for a whole month? No. Man, that's tough. Yeah. You know, you you do what you can to chase a rainbow, but, you know, sometimes a brown or a brook might might take your fly. Yeah, and not, not all of the fish are going to be spawning, too. Some right. browns are, are not going to be, and they're going to be behind the red mm-hmm. eating the eggs that happen to come back or just doing their normal thing they're just not spawning for whatever reason so if the fish are right on the bed and you see them all huddled together on their exactly. you know seriously it's a it's a good idea to just let them be yeah yeah take that, a picture that was <clears throat> going to be my next point too you know target the maybe the deeper pools and places where they're not going to be spawning but if you do see them on the red i would i just walk on yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say that I have never done that because I have thrown eggs right onto the reds and caught every fish on the red and, and returned them. Uh, they go back onto the red, but it does take some strength out of them, and it can, you can injure them, and uh, they can get to the point where they finish their spawning, but their just energy is gone. They die after that. So I don't know. My, my philosophy is now is to just leave those fish alone. Well, we have to be considerate of it and conscious of it, too, because, for example, where we live here in Utah, Jason, where you used to fish 20 years ago um, versus what it looks like today is completely different. In the last 20 years, it seems like the, the population here in Utah has almost doubled. You, you go up the Provo River now, and there's guys every 100 feet. The fish see yeah. so much more fishing pressure than they did 20 years ago. Yeah. And so, yeah, remote places, you know, Alaska, Montana, where they don't see that much pressure, maybe you can't, maybe you can't do that much harm. But in pressured waters, you really have to be conscious of it. Good point. Yeah, good point. So speaking of rivers, Jason, what's different for the rivers in the fall? Well, they're they're usually lower in volume. They're usually clearer, um, you know, for the most part. And fish are a little bit more spooky. But there's also uh, you got your midges that are still going to be hatching, and you've got your blueing olive hatch that takes up about four weeks, a good four weeks of three to four weeks of the fall too, that can make a difference. So. Um, if you're into dry fly fishing, always have some olives, uh, bluing olives in their life cycle stages. 
Mm-hmm. Um, as a, as a streamer fishing goes, though, it's really a good time because, um, it, whereas in the summer, morning and afternoon, late afternoon, evening, rainy days, those are going to be primarily your streamer days. But in the fall, when things cool off, uh, a streamer might work at any time during the day, and that's that's fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, some say all of midges or mayflies is a is a good thing to have in the fall too. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely. And uh, you can't forget about your terrestrials either. Uh, your hoppers, crickets, beetles, ants, all those things still work. Um, I've I've thrown grasshoppers in November, in fact, on Thanksgiving. And the fish just get so used to eating them through the summer that if they see something, even though the hoppers are all long since frozen, uh, a lot of them will still go up and just eat it. Mm-hmm. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't be caught without some of those either sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. If you're fishing small water um, that's covered, that has a lot of trees on both banks, you know, in the fall, you're going to get a lot of debris on the water. So if you get to some of those areas where there's leaves and small branches, you know, on the water, it's a good idea to to twitch your terrestrials a little bit, show a little movement and differentiate between it being just debris and a nice tasty meal for the fish. Yeah. Good good point, man. I wanted to ask you, Jason, on leader length. Do you lengthen your leader in the fall opposed to spring and summer? You know, with the streamer bite, it's I'm just gonna let the fish tell me uh what what they want because I'm um I we both use super heavy leaders to try and propel these guys forward a little bit because they yeah. are big. Yeah, and they weigh a little bit, so a stout, stiff leader is going to be the best. But if I see fish come up on the the fly and they don't react to it right, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to lengthen the, the at least the tippet part a little bit to see if I if, if the knots are causing a problem or if the diameter of the tippet mm-hmm. is causing a problem, um, and then I'll adjust it from there. But my total leader length depends. It's it's usually about five feet, and then the tippet can be wherever. I'm I'm because the water clarity where we fish, it's so clear. Usually, the fish get a good look at that. Yeah. And, but if but in turnover situation, my total leader might be uh, four to five feet is all, yeah. including the tippet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say uh, it's something to consider because, you know, those fish are getting hammered all summer long. That's the most fishing pressure they see all year. So Mm -hmm. in the fall, you know, if you're not having success, that's one thing to consider is lengthening it. I've heard some guys say they go as long as 15 feet, um, you know, just to give themselves a better chance because of all the pressure pressure the fish have just seen. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, and just a word on that, Chad. When we when we fish the bigger flies like this, twenty pound tippet fluorocarbon is going to be what we use for this. I mean, for a multitude of reasons, but and this is a big fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the big juvenile trout head, seven inch weighted fly with the rattle. So yeah, so. 20 pound. The, the, when the fish come after this, they're usually not two liter shy. So we yeah. 20 pound on that. But when, when we drop down to maybe like a shiner pattern like this or whatever, I'll put zero X on and, and it's fine, you yeah. know, no, no problem. And, uh, works, works really well. Yeah. I think, you know, the question I asked you probably applies more to guys that are throwing dries or, or nymphing. Yeah. Because like you said, these big flies, man, <laughs> fish don't really seem to notice the tippet for us. Yeah. We, you know, that's a long tip, even five feet for most streamer guys, but, um, yeah. I'm, I'm throwing them with a 10 weight line and, and that big massive line can throw, uh, turn over a, a longer leader, no problem. But, um, you know, we're, we're either doing a an eight weight or a 10 weight and you know, you can get away with a little bit longer leader then still has to be pretty massive at the butt. (laughs) Well, yeah, I agree. Uh, 
Yeah, I've experienced too long a leader uh, for these big flies, and it just it's hard to turn over and cast. So yeah, I've done it yeah. right and I've done it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, leader length, I would just adjust it to to meet your conditions because they they change. And if if you're getting refused, it could be your leader. It could be it's it's they can either see it or the knots or it's not long enough. You know, so I would be prepared to adjust that. Yeah. You know, one other factor to consider, too, in the fall, Jason, is the position of the sun. Uh, it's at a lower angle in the sky. So particularly if you're fishing smaller water and streams, you're going to cast a longer shadow, and you really have to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess even for us, too, on, up on our reservoir, that's our favorite water in the fall. But where the fish are closer to shore... Uh, we have to be conscious of that, too, because depending on where the sun is, man, you can cast a 20-foot shadow. Mm -hmm. I think a shadow with movement is the thing that gets them because they, they love being in the shade, obviously, or even in the boat shade. Yeah. <laughs> but it's that shadow, that quick shadow with movement that just, bam, yeah. they, they, don't, they don't like that and they're gone. So that good point, too. I mean, be well, I think a lot of times when you're – you're especially when you're going over a bank and you're elevated, and that's when you really need to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to give yourself every advantage that you have, do you take into consideration, and again, particularly if you're fishing small water like a stream or a river, the color of your clothing? Do you vary that Definitely. at all? Um, I, you know, in the summer... If if you're going to be – the fish are looking up and if if what they can see for the majority of the time is blue sky or whatever, I'm going to have a blue shirt on. Yeah. Um, if you're just in the, the trees a lot or whatever, I might go to a green, but it's pretty much I'm in a blue shirt most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I know some guys do change to fall colors. They'll try to wear – you know, something olive, yellow, orange up top. Some go camo. You know, it's something to consider just to give yourself every advantage possible. Yes, but well, in, the, in, in the fall, I'm going to be in black a lot. Mm -hmm. Just be in as we go into winter, especially <laughs> when. Just to absorb the heat. <laughs> is, yeah, exactly. Because uh, I guess in the reservoir, we can cast far enough or just out where I would rather have the heat advantage versus whether they can see me, you know? Yeah, for sure. I would say, uh, again, I don't want to get into this too much because we've done a few podcasts on it, just gear, uh, particularly your clothing and being prepared. But the point I would make is make sure you take the appropriate apparel in gear for the weather conditions because, again, if you're cold, if you're hungry, if you're tired, whatever, it can totally affect uh, the day on the water and your yeah. performance. So Being hungry especially. <laughs> <laughs> well, this time of year, and especially where we fish, uh, we're in the Rocky Mountains here in Utah, and our reservoir is over 7,000 feet. The weather varies greatly from morning to afternoon to evening, and so we have to pack a lot of gear, a lot of layers, a lot of jackets, uh, you're talking gloves and hats, good footwear, so you have to take it all. Yeah, uh, definitely. I would say also when you get there, you you got to have some flies that are going to be effective or else your days, you know, you want to catch fish and you want to catch the big fish. So, um, Chad, you have a baby whitey and I don't have one with me, but – that would be the smallest size fly I would I would probably throw in the fall, okay. which is about that for those, four inch mark. Yeah, for those watching the video version, that's the size we're talking. That's a awesome awesome fly. It's got some loudness. It's kind of like that tuxedo in Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Everybody's gonna notice that orange. <laughs> that's so cool. Well. Last it, fall, we had a lot of success on that color, so we'll give her a yeah. go next week. Now, that one, the, so after that, then I would go with this. This is a, a streamer with a mini trout head on it, and it's just slightly more bulky than the baby whitey. 
Um, I would use this probably in the brightest part of the day if we're not getting reactions to the bigger flies. Yeah. So, so baby whitey, this mini trout fly, probably the, the brightest part of the day. And especially as the water starts to clear from, from turnover uh, and it's not as murky, then I, I would drop down to this size. After that, though, and I'm just going to descend down, you're probably go to a little bit bigger fly, which are your chub patterns, and these are going to be in the five five inch range. Sweet. And then, of course, you have these in natural color as the water clears, and definitely have some in. Like here's this is another natural, semi natural. But then always uh, have something crazy. Get something that's bright and loud in that five-inch range too uh, as turnover happens. And this looks like a saltwater fly, but this color really sticks out and mm -hmm. kind of the, the deeper water. Yeah, awesome. And then lastly on that too, if you're fishing streamers like us, you know, you're wanting to chase those big fish – in addition to color, brightness, you know, natural versus an attractor pattern, the other thing we do, Jason, and again, depending on water temps and conditions, is vary the strip speed. You know, uh, depending on if it's super cold, especially in the morning, the fish might be a little more lethargic, and so a slower retrieve might be the ticket. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we bring it in fast, you know, a, a very active retrieve and that seems to trigger them hitting it so mm. you just got to vary that too yeah um when they are close to shore too chad um sometimes right when that fly hits the water they are on it and yeah. so like in the summertime when we make a cast we're not we're letting it sink down and it you don't have that chance usually very often of them just smacking it right when it hits the water but this time of year when that fly hits the surface, be ready. Keep the line <laughs> tight. <laughs> so three times this year, Jason, I didn't learn the first or second time because I'm an idiot, apparently. <laughs> but I, I just chucked my fly out there to retrieve my line. And I wasn't even planning on, you know, stripping it or anything. I was just going to reel it in. But a fish hit it three times and I wasn't ready. I didn't set the hook. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, one of them I got lucky and I landed, but the other two I just <laughs> caught me so off guard. So anytime your fly hits the water, is in the water, you got to be ready. Definitely. Yeah, where, where they're up closer to the surface and they're closer into the bank and they're, they're just looking. I mean, that's their objective is to eat whatever gets in front of them usually. And that could be your fly. And right when it hits the water, you might have just a second to set the hook. So that brings me to my next point that I did. I I put this around my neck so that I wouldn't forget it, but this is a hook sharpener, a hook hone, and uh, you catch a few fish or, you know, the, your hooks are going through debris, getting caught on stuff. It's so easy to dull that point, and you need that point to be super sharp. I mean, how many times have you been stripping in and you feel a nice fish and it just doesn't stick, and it's because you know, your hook's not sharp. So if this is handy, I mean, if you have to dig for it in the winter with gloves on, you're probably not going to use it. So have it handy in your hand. And then depending on how bad your hook is damaged, uh, there's multiple, this one's from rising, but there's kind of a rougher part of the uh, track that you can get the point started again. And then there's a, a finer track in here to really fine tune it and get it sharp and sticky again yeah good tip brother we were up on our reservoir two weeks ago um and we were catching fish and i didn't change my fly all day because it was working but uh there was two fish later in the day that when i got them in got them into the net the the hook came right out and i had to sharpen the hooks i mean even just <laughs> in the course of a day uh you can notice a difference in the hook dulling 
Yeah. Sometimes like it, when you're a good fisherman like you, you can, <laughs> you have a dull hook and you can just keep the pressure on and it's not going to come out, but <laughs> yeah. you want that hook buried in there. So when they're fighting and struggling, you know, when they turn their head back and forth, it's stuck there so it doesn't come out. And it's so often we've had them pop out. And well, some, some days guys like me even get lucky, so. <laughs> Yeah. No, but definitely if I hadn't kept the pressure on, uh, I probably would have lost those those fish. Mm-hmm. So good tip, man. Yeah. Fall fishing, it's huge. Oh, it's a big man. topic. It is. So, well, so let's leave it here today. Maybe we'll do a part two next week uh, if we think we have more that we wanted to cover. But that's a good overview between the rivers and the lakes. In general, I would just say, what an awesome time to get out. The fish are still active. They're going to be more accessible than, you know, any time in the last six months. You know, since right. spring, they're going to be up closer to the surface, more accessible for guys to, to get, especially the big guys. And so you got to hit it. Less guys on the water with the weather, you can hit it all day long. You can't get better. No, it's just an awesome time to be out. And if I would just say, you know, if any of the guys uh, watching or gals or whatever, if there's a topic specifically related to fall that you want us to talk about, send us a message and let us know and then uh, we can get on that. Absolutely. We appreciate all feedback, all comments and, and requests that we get. So Can't wait. Go stick one solid, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Get out there and enjoy it, guys. Stay safe on all of your fishing adventures. And as Jason said, remember to stick them solid. All right, friends. Thanks for listening to the Drop Jaw Flies podcast. Please send us your feedback. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook and on our website, www.dropjawflies.com. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, or on our YouTube channel. Now get out there and hook a big one and stick them solid.